We did it. What's your name? Uh, Harrison. Hi, Harrison. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. Thank you for doing this. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I know we planned to do this um, before uh, the, the release, but now that it's, it's come out, how, how do you feel the, um, the release has gone? Like the, the reaction to everything? People seem to be quite overwhelmed by it and um, by the huge journey of it. Um, and it is a huge journey, as you know, having seen it. And uh, the reaction seems to be like overwhelmingly positive. Um, I guess people are just, they're, they're touched and moved by it on any number of levels. Yeah. And um, that's just really cool. Yeah, no, I, I loved the film. It was, it was brilliant. It's one of my favorite films that I've seen in quite a long time. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to ask was, um, in these Planet of the Apes films, we have people playing chimps, we have gorillas, and then we have an orangutan. And I was wondering what, what distinguishes an orangutan, playing an orangutan from playing, say, a chimp, as Andy Serkis would have to do, or from playing a gorilla? This is a wonderful question. It's one I actually haven't been asked often enough, I think. Um, <laughs> orangutans, because there are distinct differences between mm. all three species. Now, uh, I'm not entirely familiar with chimpanzees. I have observed and studied gorillas a little bit. But one of the major differences with orangutans, well, well there's several, actually. Um, we obviously, obviously, with all three of them, humans share more than 97% of our DNA. Uh, it's mm -hmm. infinitesimal percentages. We, as human beings, we share the most uh, DNA with chimpanzees. Um, but in terms of the evolution, um, what, what originally happened, and I think going back, oh, things are, has nothing to do with me. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at uh, <laughs> The evolution you was separated, I believe, originally about 14 million years ago when orangutans went off one way, gorillas and chimps went another way, and then about 10, I believe it's about 10 million years ago, and I may be, you know, in or out by a million years ago, <laughs> but that's when the human, human separated off from chimpanzees. It's, or it's, actually, maybe it was like it. And the um, gorillas and chimps split, and then about seven million years ago, I believe the uh, thing is, is that humans went there. So orangutans, I, I mentioned that because orangutans have been um, this species uh, unto their own for, even though we are all primates and we all, are, you know, associate from the same place, for the longest time. And they, as a species, um, I feel, having gotten to know several orangutans and studied them for the last seven years, they are they they are intrinsically orangutan. I don't know what else to say. That's just in terms of the character thing. Um, they live on the island only on the island of uh, Borneo and Sumatra and in Indonesia. So that's not they're uh, unlike the African apes. They are only they are the only Indonesian ape. They're also the only arboreal ape. Uh, so they their bodies have uh, evolved. Uh, in tandem with that, their hands and their feet both function, can have uh, functions as hands. So an orangutan can as easily grab, you know, with a foot as that. Yeah, I know, I have a lot of yoga. It's, they, they can as easily grab with a hand as with a foot. Um, and they have that yogic flexibility, which is, as a human being, is something you have to bring to it. They have this massive upper body strength. Their legs are half as uh, long as their arms. So an orangutan's arms are twice as long as their legs. So I would say in terms of the in terms of how they move, both gorillas and chimpanzees do have an ability to have a flat-footed back foot, but like push off. I'm just saying as an actor, it's one of the things. But for me as an actor, as Maurice, because Maurice's feet um, also have to, you have to have that. Hmm, I wonder if I can stand on this chair. I can't really. Um, but this, but this, can I show a little bit? Of, it's sort of like I would have a slightly, like a slightly, I don't know, I really can't show it in that little bit there. It's a full-legged stance, and I would have to drop my body posture down. And I also spent a lot of the film walking slightly on the sides of my foot. So that there'd be, so I'm trying to get my, my Karen foot, even though I'm in runners and stuff like that, um, but into a kind of a curved thing there. So I'm feeling like all of that and any of the push-offs that I have are from there. Um, the other things orangutans do, so the, in terms of uh, the, the quadrupedal gallop, say that you watch the chimps doing through a lot of, mm. a lot of that's not an orangutan thing at all. Um, it's, it's everything is coming from the upper body strength and the pull through. Right. So a crossover walk or a crutch walk, you'll often, you'll often see me doing a crutch walk as Maurice if I'm coming down something and it's usually a boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Like a double a double landing thing, which I've taken 
from the mature males that I've observed for the past several years. Um, so there's differences in the walking like that. And then, of course, they have this huge, the mature males especially, um, have this huge upper body thing. And the with the mature males, the, the cheek pads and the throat sac that creates this, and that's something that develops when um, they become an adult, um, like a voice dropping thing. <laughs> and... Uh, only for the males, for anybody who doesn't know about it, I mean, it's only for the males. And once they develop that, then they have the capacity to make long calls, which is the classic, um, the classic vocalization for mature male orangutans. And that is a huge thing. And I've, I've been fortunate to be in the presence of and listen to and record for my own study and to bring into my own voice uh, the long calls of, I think, five different mature males. They've, they've um, gifted me with letting me hear them and then, boom, I get out the... I get out from the report, and each of them is different. So for each, each depending on their age, uh, there is individual orangutans. Obviously, there is individual as any of us as humans. So uh, the mature males who I've heard long call, and the mature males that I've gotten to know, they are each each as individual as Maurice is. So my long calls as Maurice, and there's a, a long call can be it can be a massive thing that is is quite lengthy, starts out small with a <laughs> and goes off into this huge thing that then eventually, depending on what they're trying to say, can settle into some <coughs> some sighs at the end of it. Yeah. But depending on, or it can be an abbreviated long call, it's sort of a description for the sound that only is produced by mature male orangutans. Totally different from the chimps, obviously. Totally different from the gorillas and the silverback gorillas who uh, have very specific things that they do as well. Um, the, uh, and yet even with the orangutans that I've known and the female orangutans I've known, um, they each, they each can have very unique, specific sounds that they make. I know one orangutan, Maladi, who I, I'm seven years later, I'm still trying to, to get this in my voice and I haven't been successful yet, uh, entirely successful. Um, but I have brought it to a part of Maurice, not so much. Well, actually, a couple of times in war, but a couple of times in dawn as well. Melody has this thing that's like a bark, but it sounds like a... It, it's, I have to get in... When you hear it, it goes into a growly thing, too. And she's a female. And you go... But the first time I heard it, I thought, it's a bear. It's a bear. What's going on? <laughs> and you female. And it's one of the only sounds she makes. There's another um, male, Haran, who is Tawan's son, who um, his nickname is Squeaker because he sometimes squeaks very high-pitched when he's frightened about something. That's unique to oh. Haran, the Squeaker. So each of them, and then Chinta, another orangutan I know, I personally have not heard her make any sounds, though I know, I know she does. But as I say, they're each very individual like that. But their sounds are complete, their vocalizations are completely different from gorillas and chimpanzees. There's none of this, ooh, 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 none of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when it comes to the sounds of Maurice, would you say that it's more like a, an amalgamation from uh, all the different uh, orangutans that you've studied, or is it more like you've uh, deliberately uh, tried to make new sounds for Maurice to create his own uh, identity? Um, both, in a way, because there's two things I'm doing as an actor with, well, a couple of things I'm doing as an actor with this. Um, one is maintaining and striving to maintain and create Maurice's orangutan integrity throughout. So that means in terms of the quality, the vocalization, the movement, the everything. However, within this storytelling, um, there's a the specific story of Maurice. His background, his uh, character background is a performing circus orangutan, which he was before the San Bruno so-called sanctuary um, in Rise. And the fact that he was performing and had sign language as a skill, um, so there's so there's a certain sophistication, and um, a uh, he's been um, what's the word uh, when you're used to being around human beings. Maurice had that, not in a good way. So he's been very much in, imprinted, you know, in a, in a certain way, and uh, so that's also part of him, which is so that it, very individual to him, but also. And not that I never discussed this with uh, anybody, not, not, not with Matt Reeves, not with Rupert Wyatt, not with anybody. But I did look early on as an actor going, all right, where is Maurice's place within the larger storytelling of Planet of the Apes? And as an actor, I felt it was my responsibility to make a choice early on and go, 
who do I think Maurice ultimately is within this? Summer early on, this is just me, like, but oh, before for summer between rise and dawn, I went, Maurice is, is, I think, ultimately, and I can't, this is just for me, I just went, Maurice is the lawgiver. So that's, I just felt like that is probably, so I, I made that choice quietly for myself. Actually, this is the first interview I've ever said it in that I actually felt that all along. So with that comes, to my mind as an actor, a certain responsibility to um, make that part of his character as well in terms of his vocalization, like everything he does going forward. So there's something about the fact that the lawgiver would um, be, is quite fundamentalist in a way, very like we keep the eight rules, we set up the eight rules. And I felt that had to be part of Maurice's character. And so that affected in a way what I think what what when Maurice chooses to speak and when he doesn't speak as well there's something about them and so the movements towards that and so through war in particular I did bring more sound into my performance than orangutans that I know would make like you'll often hear me throughout the film going, <laughs> or whatever whatever it is like so there's more vocalization for Maurice throughout this film than there has been previously in some ways. Um, but that for me is moving towards within that character trajectory of going and then finally speaking as I do for very good reason at the end of this particular yeah. film. So yeah, so there, I think it's, it's like that. It's, it's the storytelling of Maurice here. It's orangutan integrity. And then it's also Maurice's place in terms of whatever I've um, assessed it to be within the larger storytelling and the mythology of Planet of the Apes. Um, you kind of touched up on this a little bit earlier, but I was just um, wanting to ask, obviously there's quite a big difference between male orangutans and female orangutans, both in terms of their behaviour and in terms of their physicality. And I was wondering if, when you're playing Maurice, do you ever think about him as a male character, or is that something that you kind of don't even consider when you're playing him. Um, originally, when I was first cast as Maurice, and you know, Rupert Wyatt cast me as Maurice, and I, I remember when he actually said, I first met him, and uh, when he first, he actually said to me, outright, he said, I want you to play Maurice. He's old, he's fat, and he's from the surface. And the only thing that I could think was, he? <laughs> <laughs> Time, because I was just starting to get to know about orangutans, my study of them was in its true infancy. And so I hadn't even paid attention to any of the male orangutans. At the time, I'd, I was looking at the pictures of the females and the pretty little oh, babies, and, I'm so much, like whatever that is, and then thinking, those guys, like with the great, <laughs> like, whoa, what's that? Once I dove in and just went like, okay, this is not part of... Um, my life or this is part of my journey as an actor is to become this character then no I, I, I stopped thinking about you know gender issues yeah there's other things that go into that there, I mean, there's the sound there's his weight which I've had to bring to him it is not something that so it's more specific things like that like with his weight through the first film because it's not the uh, Weta can't make that up later as brilliant as their work is they can't make up the you know landing of Maurice yeah that's up me. So what we did through Rise, was Terry Notary's heart and his wonderful training and quadrupedal walking, but he attached weights to each of my arm stilts. So as I was trucking along, you know, uh, trying to keep up with the chips, um, I had these extra weights on my arms and that really helped me. Partway through the filming of Dawn, I started Dawn also with the weights on my arms to still, you know, keep me in that weight. And partway through Dawn, I don't know rem remember when, maybe when we got to New Orleans or something, um, I went... I think I can lose them. And so that became an uh, innate part of me. So by the time we got to war, besides the fact that I could just sort of land in Maurice and the quadrupedal walking and running, which is incredibly cardiovascular, uh, if you just got down, if you tried it for maybe five minutes, you'd go, no, really? No, really? <laughs> more than this? It's an amazing thing to, to do. But by war, while I still had, and I had to train hugely to prepare for this, but now Maurice's weight is in my body, and if I just get the arm still, boom, I'm there. So it's yeah, I don't I don't think of it as being a different gender thing. I just enter into Maurice as I would into any other character I'm playing. 
Um, yeah. you, you mentioned in your, your previous answer that you consider Maurice to be kind of like uh, the lawmaker. And I was just wondering where you'd consider his sort of paternal side in that in his character. Because we sort of saw it with uh, Alexander in uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and much more now with uh, Nova in War. And yeah, I, I was just wondering where that sort of fits into Maurice as a character. Not so sure. I haven't thought about it as paternal. I have thought about it as um, um, there's something like where Maurice started in Rise is so like in that when we were in that little caged environment and stuff, that's not not a good one. Um, and Maurice connected with Caesar through the sign language. I think it's probably mm. for Maurice, and this is just my assessment of it, was possibly his first time connecting with another ape able to communicate because they had sign language. So that was so profound, and his connection to Caesar was so profound, that for Maurice, who came from a place of, like, guarded watching everything, you know, he's just good. I mean, he probably did what he was supposed to do to survive as a circus performer. But once he reached there, then he just watched and would do nothing unless it was, you know, he knew it would be safe, which is also quite an orangutan quality, to be very specific about actions, only to take, only to take effective actions and not do anything gratuitous. But I think it was more than entering into a paternal quality of thing. His connection with Caesar kind of opened him up a bit so that he became more, um, sort of came more into himself, more willing to be the yeah. and, and the character that he actually is. So then when we get to Dawn and Maurice meets Alexander, it's less about paternalism, I think, than... Um, he made a connection with, he, like, he was interested in the book, and then Alexander gave him the book. And that's like, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it just reached Maurice on a level yeah. that, like that. So he, he was responsive to that when later in Dawn, he said to um, Alexander and his family, God, you know, it, it, like the, the one time he had to speak in that was to go, was to offer something. So then coming to, no, coming to meet Nova and finding Nova in this one, and actually on the first day we had, it was about, it was, there was an early day before we started filming where Matt Reeves and Andy Serkis and I and Terry Notary and Michael Adam played actually. We were in a room going through the script because as a posse we wanted to track through the journey. So I had a couple of questions for Matt Reeves. Not a lot because the script is so well written and so everything that's on the page is everything you need as an actor. But I did have a couple of questions for Matt and one of the things... I asked him was, um, when Maurice gets to Nova, what's your feeling on why he takes her? I just thought as an actor, I was that. And, and I'll never forget Matt Reeves went, she's a broken bird. You take along the broken bird. And I went, great, thank you. That's it. <laughs> there was no extra, oh, you know, as beautiful as all that, it, or, you know, as, as specific and all that is, that's the place that Maurice is functioning from. It's a very organic, very, I almost like if I was to put it in words, I don't know why I must do this, but I must do this. Mm. And so the journey begins rather than the journey, rather than going, I'll take care of you and answer. It's like it, it initiates a question of a journey rather than finishing one. So not paternal, maternal, right? It's just, so then Maurice is on that journey. He's following an inner uh, impulse that he simply must. You just touched upon something that I thought was really interesting. So I think Matt Reeves is very, very good at character work and particularly, I think, is evident in both of these Planet of the Apes films that he's made, doing character work with minimal dialogue. And I was wondering, as, as an actor working with Matt Reeves, what do you think it is about his... What is it that he does that manages to make all of those silent, calm scenes work? How does he make those non-dialogue, non-talky, non-action scenes so engaging and so deep? It's a commitment to truth. That, that I don't know how else to put it. He's going for the truth of the emotion, the truth of the story, and working with him is um, it's incredible. I mean, it's, you, the experience couldn't get any, any better because he is looking at every moment, he's just going, okay, and then what about this? But it's it's already, he's already, he and Mark Bombeck have already started by giving this to us on the page. And then obviously, well, obviously working in tandem with someone like Andy Circus, please. You know, <laughs> you know it's like, um, uh, you just go, okay, what, I, what do I have to do? Show up, be available, 
um, know where I'm going, just be entirely present and give 5,000%, like just be there entirely. So it's a matter of just the focus and then honing in. And I believe that's what Matt Reeves does because we may do something, um, we may do, I don't know, sometimes 5, 10, 20 takes into something, but it's not necessarily, oh, do it differently, oh, do it differently. It's not, he's not, um, what's the word? He's not sort of playing around with us as actors. He's he's like he's honing in with a chisel or he's carving, like where you're going, through, ah, there it is. Now I've got it right there. And so as actors, you just go on that with him and then you just go, 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 go. So the, the his attention and his listening to the inside story, um, it, it, his, his attention is so deep and is so in there that what he's crafting is on a very deep level. And I think that's why it holds interest. And then obviously when he's editing and, and, the, and refining and which beats he's actually going to share uh, that's, that remain in the film, um, uh, uh, the, the same attention is there. Now that said, basically I can't think of, I was going through and going, is there anything that I filmed that didn't show up on the screen? And I don't think so. So it's like everything we did, like everything that we did, uh, I, like the whole thing was there. So basically I've already experienced the film at yeah. least for my own part as an actor is the refinement of that was there on the sound stage or out on location or wherever we, are, we were or in reshoots or whatever. So it's, it's his attention to emotional truth detail is so, oof, um, he, yeah. his laser shot. he's a truth seeking missile. That's what he is. <laughs> Uh, one aspect of the the character that I wanted to talk about was um, that uh, over the past three films, Maurice has basically become uh, like a fan favorite, and I, I was just wondering uh, what you think has caused him, uh, what particular characteristics has caused him to become, uh, you know, resonate with audiences so much. I, I think we have to ask like people who get attached from the outside because I don't think I can answer that one. I, I really because what I can say is from my own experience of getting to know orangutans and specifically to Juan, who Maurice is based on, from my perspective. Um, and, and Maurice very much is inspired by to Juan, a mature male orangutan, who um, I first observed in 2010 and then got to know throughout the rest of his life. Um, and to Juan, whose name translates as master, and truly was the master in every way. So all I can say is that the experience that I had getting to know to Juan and the gifts that he gave me along the way in terms of guidance on just about it. I mean, you know, like, uh, like inter- I could observe him and I learned a great deal that I brought into Maurice. But all that aside, just in terms of my own relationship or communication with him as Karen to Tawan, um, I had this feeling of this, like I felt like I was in the presence of a master and of so uh, a being who is considerably greater than myself in some way um, and very compelling and irresistibly compelling in such a way that once I got to know Tawan, who then introduced me to, but I, I've always felt like this, Tawan introduced me to the rest of his orangutan family and then all the people working in conservation and then the larger world of orangutans around the world like that. Um, it's something that I think it felt, sort of feels like magic. It's a, part of my life that will will only grow now it's been growing and i i can't ever see it stopping so i is it something along those lines that once people actually get the experience of hopefully some sense of orangutan that you go i, I need to know more i don't know i don't but i but i am um i hope that i am continuing to play him with orang, orang, orangutan integrity maurice and and hopefully this does evoke some sense of the incredible being that Tuan was in his lifetime. Uh, I was wondering if there was anything, um, going back to sort of the, the physical differences between humans and orangutans, I was wondering if there was anything, perhaps it could even be something that seems fairly inconsequential, that was quite difficult to do just because you're trying to do it like an orangutan, like, I don't know, horse riding or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about, how about every step of the physical process for this? Um, as I said, quadrupedal walking alone. Like Jeff's just saying, I, I've, I've been a dancer for most of my life and done 20 years of musical theater and mm-hmm. had some pretty big dancing roles and everything. So when it came to like, and I mean this seriously, when it came to quadrupedal walking and I looked at it and went, 
well, what's so difficult about left foot, right hand, right foot, <laughs> left foot, right? You say, please, I can do triple pirouettes. Give me a break. Then you then you get over there and you do that and you go, and the next thing you know, you're in a tangle on the floor. It, and if you've actually got some orange stilts at some point or some toilet plungers, you could try and just go left foot, right hand, right foot, left hand. Get your weight onto your front arms. You will find that, you, and then try to move and then start to use those things. So this was difficult from the get-go. On the first one, especially with the weights on my arms, my shoulder joints were just screaming. Um, it, the, the training that is required to be able to do this with some facility and ongoing cardiovascular strength and everything, that's huge. Um, the upper body strength, uh, when we were doing rise and... You know, there's the bit when they're swinging under the bridge and stuff at the end. Mm. Well, some like in a couple of those things, you'd, you'd, they'd have the lo a location shot, but then um, we would do later, just for specific things like that, that were sort of extraordinary. You're not going to hang an actor from underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. It's not going to happen. So they do that thing, and then and then when we were in the volume later, we'd still have to do everything. Like, you know, escape from the sanctuary was literally jumping off a platform you know, six feet above something else, boom, and wang, 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 wang down. So it's like you're doing all the same things. Jumping off of the cars was jumping off of, you know, same height things and everything. But um, I remember the swinging under the bridge thing. As much as I have built up strength, uh, there is no way I could conceivably come up with the strength to wing, 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 like under something like that. So they, they um, created a sort of a ladder thing and mm. it, for me to swing like that. But even at that, Three swings later, I was like, oh, oh. So, so <laughs> at the time, he put, okay, let's get the apple boxes. So they put little apple boxes, and I wish I could show you, because I literally was like going up here. I was swinging, literally, but underneath, way down there, my toes were just touching the apple box, and I was like, the answer going, and you didn't see my feet. And then obviously what they get later is the swinging thing. Yeah. So that was like things like that. So that, that upper body strength to do those things. Other climbing things, like when we did all the scaling of the buildings at the end of dawn, and we did that on real like rebar things that were separated, you know, like this. And we climbed all of that. Um, that I found hard where with the chimps, because they have that back push off thing, um, they can use more of their back feet. But for me, it's more for it to have an integrity and have to use like basically this would just have to be there. Like the lower part of my anatomy would not be a push off place. So I had to pull myself up and down all that stuff just with my arms. That was extremely difficult. So physically, so, yeah, those were, those were, um, yeah, those were the, the most extraordinary things where it took that kind of swimming thing. And then with the horseback riding, the horseback riding was amazing, especially in this film. Um, and I had, we, we did ride horses in the, in Dawn, but not a great deal. But with this one, obviously, that required a facility not just to ride for me, but to um, guarantee the safety of Amaya riding behind me, which and she right. rode behind me throughout. Um, and, uh, and we were in incredibly challenging environments in the snow and on the beaches with waves coming in, you know, literally on, on the open ocean there. And, and I have a, had a beautiful horse, Navarone, through the film who a uh, very gentle, gentle soul, but also an 18 hands high Dutch Friesen stallion. So like when you see me dismounting off of him, this is, you know, these are considerable <laughs> long way. <laughs> so um, I found that challenging, like all that physical stuff, the dismounts and the mounting and stuff. But I did have a wonderful month long training with um, Danny Virtue here in Vancouver, who's a horse whisperer for sure. And Danny trained us more than anything to manage our own energy so that at all times I could, it was my responsibility to make sure that Navarone felt okay with me, with wearing this huge blue couch on my back. and <clears throat> So Navarone had to get used to me being like that. And, and also, so I had to be able to walk around in front of him and with the arm stilts. And it, it was, it was quite the journey, but it was, one of the most beautiful gifts of this film was that month. And I'll never forget a day, probably been three weeks into the horse training when, uh, and doing lots of different things in different terrains. And Danny would take me up onto the hills and around every day. Cause I was probably the least experienced on horseback of anybody. Terry and Andy had a lot more experience than I did. That right. way. So Danny would take me out on trail rides and I'd have to learn to 
teach never, oh, not teach never, oh, but never would love to like eat leaves and bushes and stuff along the way. Bit of a pushover. So we would be going on. The next thing I knew, Danny would be riding ahead of me, and now everyone would go, and I think he'd be he had a whole bush, and we're walking along. I hope Danny doesn't turn around right now. Don't turn around, and then Danny would turn and go, Aaron, rein in your horse, and I'd have to get in order to spit out the bush and carry on. And so, but it was training me to to be with all of this stuff. Sorry, just quickly check it. Are you still okay for time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great, great. Thank you. Um. Is it okay then just to jump into like what, one last question then? Uh, we, we have five more minutes, yeah. As this is kind of like the, the end of the trilogy, I was just wondering uh, how you're planning to uh, continue your, your work with orangutans and the kind of the connection that you've built with orangutans over the past uh, few years. First of all, I will say it's not, some people sometimes say, what about your work with orangutans? And it's so not work. I study them and I'm a student of them. I'm a really grateful student. And I, feel, I feel that strongly, like the choice of words there, because... I happen to know many fine people who work with orangutans in, in, and I'm following their work in Borneo and Sumatra, supporting as I can, and also at the Center for Great Apes in Wachula, Florida. So I have, like I foster orangutans in a couple of different places, the Center for Great Apes, um, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program in Sumatra, and then the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation in Borneo. There are many other organizations doing incredible work uh, in the conservation of orangutans that I do follow, but these are the these are the groups that I've gotten to know over the last six years and follow their work most closely. Um, so, and also the orangutan SSP in North America, the Species Survival Plan, through whom at their conferences I've been introduced to everybody doing this incredible work out there. So, will I study and learn from orangutans for the rest of my life now and do what I can to follow and support? Yes. Um, where I, I can't see that stopping. And also the orangutan family that I know in Seattle and um, the relationships I've made with the caregivers there uh, that has connected me to the water conservation community. Yeah, that's ongoing. There's two people in particular in Seattle at Woodland Park Zoo, um, Laura McComeski and Andy Antilla, who are, they were, they introduced me to Tawan. Not the first time I went to meet, to, to observe Tawan, I observed him on my own. But when I was brought, invited back for an introduction, these two wonderful people introduced me further to the world of conservation, the orangutan SSP, which led to the Center for Great Apes, and Dr. Singleton's work in Sumatra, Dr. Graham L. Baines's work with DNA. Um, it, there's an amazing group of people working out there that I follow. So, yeah, will it continue? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, especially for, for so long. Yeah, no, thank you. It was really interesting. Thanks, you guys, so much. Okay, you can hang up because I don't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.